I have felt just the last few years that he must have had a wonderful sense of humor. I feel that there's a, a tremendous amount of the music that he wrote that has a great deal of humor in it. And probably given the chaos uh, in his life with such a, a large family and all the students that he was teaching in Leipzig and all the deadlines for cantatas every Sunday, uh, he better have had a sense of humor or uh, he would have gone crazy. <laughs> But there's another side, the, the uh, other side of the coin to the emotional and the human relationship uh, is the practical side. And Bach was a numerologist. I mean, there are all kinds of examples of numerology in much of his music, a lot of it, um, and including in the Chacon um, that uh, he used his, the number in his name that Bach, if you take the alphabet, uh, German alphabet, it would be B is the second letter of the alphabet, A, 1, C, 3, and H is 8, 14. And the total number of measures in the Chacon is 257, 2 plus 5, plus 7, somewhere he put his name into it. And there are many other examples just in the Chacon alone, which I could get to. Um, that use numbers. And that also has got me really thinking um, with, uh, as a, a musician, you're an actress with a violin. I mean, really, you should know who you are playing in any piece that you're playing. What, what is it about? I mean, as an actor on stage, you have to know, am I playing somebody who's 15, am I playing somebody who's 40, am I playing a grandmother, okay? I mean, you don't talk the same, you don't walk the same, and so on. You don't just read the words, but I think that unfortunately a lot of music uh, or musicians just read the words, and it can be uh, covered over by a great sound, which is very, very attractive. It's a very beautiful thing, a very alluring thing, but uh, it only lasts for so long. and. In playing Bach, of course, one uh, can be aware of the numbers. And for decades, years, I thought, well, you know, it's just numerology, it's just a superstition. And I'm not a superstitious person. But then it occurred more recently again that, uh, hey, uh, Sir Isaac Newton proved all sorts of things just with numbers. And Albert Einstein predicted all sorts of things in the universe just numerically. So maybe there really is something to the relationship of numbers. And it, this is not original, but I think that if Bach were not a musician, maybe he should have been a mathematician because his use of mathematics in a varied way uh, thinking of all the possibilities and what works, eliminating this and taking that and so on, uh, has a mathematical overtone. Um, and therefore, like the equation E equals MC squared, very, very simple the equation, but yet it's terribly complex. And I think the same is true of Bach. In one sense, the music speaks directly to you in its, very, in its simplicity. But on the other hand, it is enormously complex. And so you can enjoy Bach and you can love Bach on any level that you want, whether it's just this that reminds you of something uh, extraordinary in the world, something that you want to be a part of. On the other hand, you can say, what does it, and, and start asking the endless questions of why is it great? And as a performer, you have to do it and say, that's 
who I am. That's the actor. That's what I'm doing. Right. I, I like that you mentioned how there's a simplicity to, you know, any, a given piece by Bach. And I think that is often overlooked because the final product can sound so complex because there's so many different moving parts. But I think that perhaps an analogy could be made between uh, a piece of music by Bach and just any ordinary human being. I mean, we're all basically made of the same stuff and uh, each person has their basic personality. But then with our lives, you know, we, as individuals, we experience so many different things and no one person's life is the same as another's. And all of these experiences and ideas, you know, learning, education, art, culture, whatever it is that you're going through adds up to the complexity of a single human being. And so our brains, while, you know, we may see ourselves in, you know, just a few terms, there's just so much going on inside our heads, inside our lives. And I think maybe even the same could be said about a single piece of music. You know, it's built on just a few building blocks and, when you have a composer like Bach, who's got this great imagination and ability to evolve those building blocks, then you end up with something that's quite complex. But that doesn't mean it has to be one or the other. It can be both at the same time, just like a human being. So speaking of love and music, can you go into what your love for Bach's Chacon is all about? I see my life in the Chaconde, where it was just rudimentary and just beginning. And when it began uh, more like a very young person to see more, um, I, and then as it grew and developed and uh, playing it over and over, for audiences talking about the piece uh, in uh, a lecture, uh, which I call the Chaconde God, Music and Numbers. Um, and I, I can see decades through in my own life um, so that you can really trace uh, from a young person to someone with hopefully a fair amount of maturity at my age, I'm not sure, uh, but I hope so. And uh, uh, I guess if it had to be any one piece that I could identify that way, that you see your whole life, it would have to be the Shock Hong. Um, and uh, it's been a very great companion. I mean, how many people can go through life uh, sharing a great, great work. It's uh, something that I can go to when I need comfort, when I need solace. It's something I can go to for inspiration. It continues to challenge me, you know, what what does it mean? Night after night, I still lie awake going through it, thinking of what this chord is and what's the relationship to this chord or that chord. What does it think Bach is thinking? And it's not... Uh, just idolizing or worshiping another person, but in this case, Bach. But it's the recognition that there are these handful of people throughout time and history who had insights that were so far above the norm. And they are markers in life, as we've spoken about, whether it would be Einstein or Shakespeare. Uh, or Christ, or Moses, or Plato, who give that extra something, which I guess we call inspiration, in addition to comfort. I think your lecture, which you've been doing for decades now, um, is so illuminating and inspiring, um, and people can watch it on YouTube. There's a version of your of your mass your lecture on YouTube. Um, but 
are there certain moments within the piece that you could share with us here that are particularly special um, just from a, a personal, emotional perspective? Uh, yeah. Um, I feel that after that opening of the first few very... <laughs> That I think it has to be humor, and that he gets more and more serious. I think the opening of the D major section uh, I don't know what I think of now. For many years, I thought of that it was just going into a church, uh, and that is this great contrast from the opening chords uh, uh, that, that it now moves, moves in a linear way. Uh, then the numerology section where he gets to the high point uh, at the golden section, the point six one eight. Uh, And how he develops a yum 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 idea until it just can't go any further. Um, and of course, just the return to the theme at the, the very end uh, gives me a feeling that it's been, in those 14 minutes, a lifetime. What a, how fortunate I am to have that. You know, if I didn't have anything else in life, and I have a great deal more, thankfully, uh, but to have that was already a blessing. Yeah, I, I remember um, when you were teaching me the piece, the, uh, the D major, the opening of the D major section that you just played for us was so, um, it just felt so peaceful to me, but also, um, not not just being calm, but I, I felt almost like I was floating, especially because it what precedes it is so dramatic and, and full of um, you know all of these to me what feels like pent up emotions that are just then starting to gush out and out and out and it it, it overflows and it's you know it's like to me when I feel like I you know I'm so overwhelmed with the burden of, of something that is stressful or sad and, and you know the tears come out and you just cannot hold anything back in then to suddenly it's like being blessed with a moment where you know even the sun comes out shines on you and, and it's just like it takes you take yourself out of reality and you're in a different place in a different mental emotional and even physical space and that contrast is just so it's just so like un unparalleled i guess i could say and i think it's also interesting that you said you mentioned that sometime you thought of it as like going into a church and i remember for my thesis you know i, I made a video to go along with the music and at that point um the character in my video walks into a church and sees an angel and um so I, I enjoy that similarity. Um, and I also remember when you talked to me about the golden section, and I was so young, at, and at that age, I didn't quite understand what that was all about. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who can relate in the same way to how I felt, you know, just not understanding the, the mathematical aspect because, you know, math is, is not something that I very much enjoy. <laughs> um, but just, I think for me, the point was that even as you were explaining something that I couldn't quite grasp, the music itself spoke to what you were teaching. You know, I, I would play this part and, and, and then it would just go up. And, and it, again, it felt like being lifted by the music, but it was, it's also like possibly, I think the most intimate moment in the piece. It's, it's there like, at the at the high point. Yes, at the high point, and and you know it's like 
even though you keep playing, it feels like at that high point, that time stops and, and you're free. And it's just like, there's nothing else like that. I guess if you're, you know, religious and, and Christian, then you could imagine like that would be the point of entering heaven and, and, and just feeling like everything being let go. Um, but I think it's so phenomenal that, you know, Bach being a musical mathematician, let's say, can take something that seems so like, you know, abstract and, and technical and, and just make it so um, like beautiful and raw in, in a human way. That, that those, those spots have also always stuck with me. And then of course, like you said, the ending too, when it comes back, to that very opening theme, um, except I always loved, you know, one of my favorite parts about your lectures was talking about how, you know, the piece starts and it's based on these four notes, ba 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 ba, and then going back to ba, and you know, we don't have to know that to appreciate the piece, but at the same time, I think, you know, Bach makes it clear even if even without studying it, that, you know, when he begins the piece, it, because it's a dance and, and because it starts on a variation rather than just the four notes, that you feel like it's going to go somewhere. And then when he finishes the piece, it actually does land on each of those four notes. And I think that is how the audience then receives this sensation of something being completed you know like we can rest easy now because we've gone through all of life and now this is the end and this is what it all boils down to and i think that's something that we feel even if we haven't you know even if we don't know what notes are necessarily being played you said you, you don't have to know and it's true i mean if you just and it, so what you, you're not going to move any audience playing that and i th i would equate again high um shakespeare that if you just think he says to be or not to be, uh, that's nice. But if you know he's saying to live or do I kill myself, you have a very, very different impression of what's going on on stage. Absolutely. And I think that's the difference with the music too. Right. And I think that it's very, very important. I, I like to, to use the analogy since I think about music and, and being love, uh, that say to the students, an author can only write, I love you. But in a play, let's say, it doesn't mean I love you, but that's what he wrote. Okay. And I say, you say, I love you one way to your mother, to your father, it's different, to your grandmother, to your best friend at school, to a lover. And there's a very big difference between I love you and I love you. Maybe we stop on that note. <laughs> Absolutely. Mr. Kaplan, thank you so much for joining me. It's been such a joy and a pleasure, as always, to discuss music with you and performance. And, and it's great to see you, even though, you know, we can't visit with each other in person during this time. Well, it's great to visit with you. And every time you send me a recording or something, it's uh, another great visit in a way that very few people have. So thank you. Good to see you. You Bye. too. Thank you. Bye. I just thought it was fun to play the violin when I started. Dr. Lewis Kaplan says Sandra is in the same league as some of his other students. Yo-Yo Ma, Pincus Zuckerman, and Emmanuel Axe. She's uh, enormously musical. It's a very big technique and a great concept of sound. This is what I believe, this is what I am, this is what the music is, and I want you to all love it, know it, and enjoy it.
everybody! As the year 2020 comes to an end, I would like to take a moment to express my gratitude to all of you who have joined me on this little classical adventure. I began this series as a way to continue exploring magnificent music while the pandemic prevented me from performing on stage. And it has been such a pleasure to share and contemplate music together with you and with each of my guests. Thank you so much to everyone who's been watching and to my subscribers. I so greatly appreciate your enthusiasm and encouragement. Classical Conscience will return on February 17th. In the meantime, I wish you and your loved ones a very safe and healthy holiday season and a very happy 2021. See you all in the new year. Bye.